tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about terrifying films insidious abductions, and Halloween horrors. I'm Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your wildest imaginations. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life are voice talents Danielle Hewitt, Jay Corvus, and Jack Del Mar. All of them top performing contestants and second round competitors in Chilling Tales for Dark Nights 2019 Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competition. If you enjoy their performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and vote on theirs and the other entries in the competition. The second round is on now, and the first handful of entries have been posted. But there's plenty more to come, and plenty of time to vote and help decide who advances. So check out our channel and join in the deliciously dark fun yet to come. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight is written by author Alice Thompson and is voiced by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Danielle Hewitt. In it, we'll meet a young woman who has been abused by her filmmaker brother for as long as she can recall. But once he sets his mind on locating the producers behind a series of disturbing violent short films as part of a series of his own, things go from bad to worse much, much worse. Without further ado, I present to you Better Films. My brother has always had a dream of being a great filmmaker. For as long as I can remember, it's been his obsession. He got a video camera for his eighth birthday and would literally film everything with it, even the most mundane things. He would have us do interviews for the camera, make little movies for himself. I thought it was cute at first, I really did. I would always help him with whatever little project he was doing this time. As time went on though, something started to change. I can't really say what made him the way he was, but he became increasingly arrogant and increasingly difficult. Our parents definitely spoiled him. Spent a small fortune making sure he got the education he needed to pursue his dreams of becoming a director. Paid for any of the expensive equipment he needed for making and editing his own little movies. Helped pay the salaries of any crew or actors he hired for the little short films he produced. 
Maybe it was that which made him become so arrogant and mean-spirited. But increasingly, he became that worst kind of cliché. The artist obsessed with their vision and treating everyone in their lives like crap. The self-centered, petulant child in an adult's body. I'd like to say that I called him out on any of this, but the sad fact is that I went right along with him on it. It started in his teens. Verbal abuse and the occasional slap any time I didn't do something right or quickly enough for his liking. I should have stood up to him, told him to get lost, but I found myself totally under his thumb. Unable to say no, or simply get him out of my life. To be honest, looking back, I can see just how unhealthy the whole thing was. Now, before you go getting the wrong idea, there was never anything incestuous here. My brother was just a bully. A little tyrant who enjoyed bossing people around. And I basically became his personal servant. He would belittle me and everything I thought, said, or tried to do. Anytime I tried to build myself up, he'd tear me down and make me feel like I couldn't accomplish anything on my own. Couldn't even survive out there without him. I should have known better, I suppose, but it had started from when we were so young that honestly a part of me came to genuinely believe the things he said. A part of me was too scared of trying to make it out there in the big wide world by myself that I put up with my brother's constant bullying and taunting and increasingly shrill, angry demands because I was scared of being alone, being cut off from the only family I had left. Our parents had passed away by this point, and we had no contact with the rest of the family. Without my brother, I'd be all by myself. His overbearing presence in my life had prevented me from making any real friends, and the thought of trying to build a life for myself, by myself, was one that just terrified me. So I did as I was told. He would say, Joan, get me a coffee. And I'd drive all the way across town to the one Starbucks he liked to get him coffee. He'd say he needed extras. And I'd devote weeks of my life to arranging and carrying out interviews. He'd demand some expensive piece of equipment, and I'd spend however much it cost to get it. That was my life now, my brother's PA slash maid. The subject of my brother's short films and mini-documentaries had become increasingly dark and surreal over the years. He would create short, strange, and frightening little pieces designed only to unsettle and scare. Or sometimes just ones that were so bizarre, so utterly devoid of plot, logic, or reason that it was impossible to tell what, if anything, he was trying to achieve or convey with them. His documentaries were much the same. He would either film about gang crime, serial killers, and rapes, or else created disjointed scenes. He once filmed a dog, starving and injured on the street for several hours. Just filming it struggling to move, to breathe. Just filmed the thing's pain. Some nights, when I went down to get a glass of water, I would see him sat there in the lounge, in the dark, watching these movies he made, just staring at the screen. And then one day, he told me about what his newest film was to be about. It turned out that he'd begun to hear stories of an urban legend in the film industry. It wasn't something that was widely talked about or acknowledged, and the people who did talk about it always seemed to do so with a certain nervousness and paranoia, as if afraid that even mentioning it was dangerous. It was called Better Films. Supposedly, it was a studio or individual who made incredibly strange movies. None of those we talked to 
who would admit to having watched a better film's production, would go into any detail about what was on the tapes. And the films were only available on VHS from what we could uncover. But all of them seemed to be incredibly disturbed by what they had seen. One had gone so far as to remove anything from their home that could play video or audio. A guy who ran a small DVD and video store told us that he'd met with some representatives of Better Films. Just once. A pair of men dressed in red suits. He described them as looking like they'd been mutilated, and claimed that one had been missing an eye and an ear, while another was minus a hand and his nose. The scarring around these wounds looked ugly and raw. They'd given him a business card, which had nothing on it. Except for the logo. A cartoonish, childlike drawing of a frowning face. And the tagline, Making better films for a better audience. Along with a website address where they claimed he could purchase their titles for his store if he wished to help support independent art. He'd checked it out expecting some kind of artsy foreign stuff in black and white. He had instead found a site full of strange and confusing clips that left him scratching his head, and that provided no clear way to order anything. He said the whole webpage appeared to be in Japanese. And yet, a week later, a black bin bag was on the front step of his shop, and inside were several tapes all with the Better Films logo on their labels. We asked him if he still had the tapes, and my brother, in particular, was very insistent that we get to watch them. The man refused, and my brother offered him increasingly large sums of money to buy or borrow one of the tapes. Finally, the man just held up a finger to my brother's lips before speaking. Now you listen to me, and listen good boy. I've seen your type. I know the look you got in your eye right now. I get a lot of weirdos in here browsing the adult section, asking if I've got anything stronger. I know what you're after. I know what you're thinking. So I'm going to tell you this, and then you're going to leave my store. What's on those tapes ain't no illegal little thrill for some gorehound trying to find himself a real-life snuff movie. What's on those tapes isn't anything like what you're imagining. What's on those tapes is worse. I ain't selling or renting them to no one. Especially not some half-wit little pervert with more money than sense. My brother stormed out in a rage, with me following close behind. As I left, the store owner called out to me. I turned to see him looking at me with an expression of genuine concern on his face now. You want my advice? Stay away from him, miss. Things he's looking into? You don't want nothing to do with. I suppose I should have taken his advice. But by this point, I doubt there was anything that could convince me to abandon my brother. So great was the hold he had over me. And so, I continued to assist him as he dug deeper and deeper into the mystery of better films. We managed to piece a few things together. The earliest encounter anyone seemed to have had with their work seemed to be in the mid-60s. One person we spoke to claimed that he'd known someone who'd been in a movie for them in the mid-70s. A porn star, who'd been hired right off the set of a film he'd been doing, and had gone missing for almost seven months. He'd come back with a lot of cash, and a hell of a lot of bad dreams. Another said that the company went back even further, that there'd been something called Better Productions, back before there'd even been silent films. Said her mother had told her stories that she'd heard from her grandmother, who'd heard them from her grandmother. Some spooky boogeyman stuff about some performer named Elizabeth Walker. We even found someone who claimed to have grown up watching a TV show Better Films had made. Sunshine Street, she said it had been called, and she went on about how strange it had been, 
and how she'd always remembered that logo. It was the first thing that had come to mind when she heard the name. She said it always used to creep her out, the way the frown would curve into a smile at the end of each episode. The animation looked eerie. That was how she described it. And then, my brother came home one day with a woman. A woman who he claimed was a producer who worked at Better Films. I was dumbfounded. For all the work we had put into this, I hadn't expected us to get anywhere. To be honest, I was pretty much convinced the whole thing was just some ghost story. That if there ever had been a Better Films, there was nothing more to it than some low-budget production company that had made a few creepy little flicks and then folded up. All the weirdness around it, all the little hints and dark suggestions we'd gotten about there being something more sinister about the whole thing. I'd put that down to just people making stuff up. Or at the very least, people having heard various stories about better films from unreliable sources and then passing them along. But here was someone who claimed to work for the company, in the flesh. She introduced herself as Miss Kismet. Her hair was bright red, almost certainly dyed. I can't believe that any hair could be naturally as bright as hers looked. She dressed in a red suit, and like the men our friend at the video store had described, she looked as though someone had gone out of their way to mutilate her body. One eye was missing, as was an ear and her nose. Three fingers were missing from her right hand as well. I tried hard not to stare, but all of these looked like they had been done so crudely, so violently, that it made me wince. She and my brother spoke at length for some time. I was not allowed to listen in or take part in whatever they were talking about. But after a while, they stepped out of the lounge and my brother asked to speak with me alone for a moment. He told me that he had convinced the woman to let him actually come to the filming of one of Better Films' movies, and to meet with the director responsible for their work, to actually interview people who worked at the highest levels of this production company, and get the real story about what they did. However, to secure this, he had to offer the woman a form of payment, he said. And that payment was her getting to spend the night with me, where I would do anything she wished. I could have slapped him. I wanted to hit him. Instead, I just yelled, told him this was too much. That I wasn't going to have him selling me like his personal property, like a slave. He shrugged, seeming not to care about my anger, my hurt. It's not that big of a deal. You like women, right? You'll probably enjoy it. And she's promised you won't be hurt in any way. His tone was cold emotionless. It was clear that he couldn't care less whether I'd be hurt or not. Couldn't care less what this person he knew nothing about and had only just met wanted to do with me. That he didn't give a damn about my well-being or my safety. That I was just another tool for him to use to make his damn movies. Oh. Oh, well that makes it perfectly okay then. And while you were selling me off to this total stranger... Did it occur to you to ask what I thought about it? To ask for my consent? My opinion on whether or not I want to have to spend a night with some woman who, for all we know, makes a hobby out of making snuff movies? He stared at me for a few moments, his expression totally unreadable. And then, slowly, he spoke. If you don't like it, then of course I can't force you to do it. You can say no. You can refuse. Just like I can refuse to let you continue to live here with me. Just like I can refuse to support you financially anymore. But don't worry. I'm sure there are plenty of job opportunities for ugly, witless, talentless little things who barely made it through high school with no real skills or likable qualities. I'm sure the local burger joint is desperate for someone to mop their floors and clean out their grease traps. And who knows, maybe after a year or two you'll be able to afford a place that barely has any roaches or rodents scurrying about in it. 
It's not like anyone will be able to stand you long enough to come visit. So really, it won't matter what it looks like. You'll be the only one living out your sad, lonely life in it. I felt like I would cry. I wanted to tell him he was wrong, to go to hell. I wanted to storm out and never see or talk to him again. But part of me kept telling me that he was right. That I was everything he said I was. A loser. An idiot without any skills or good qualities about me. A stupid, pathetic child who wouldn't survive without him. I felt like garbage. Like dirt. I felt the way he'd always made me feel. For as long as I could remember now. And meekly, I just mumbled that I would do it. That I would agree to spending a night with Ms. Kismet. We met at a motel. A sleazy looking place on the edge of town. She had sorted out a room for the night and told me to come alone with one of my brother's cameras. I was terrified. More and more as I walked to the room she had told me to come to. Terrified of what she might do to me. Of what could happen. If she killed me, my brother would probably help her hide the body. I knocked and I heard a familiar voice tell me to enter. The room was pitch black as I stepped in. Almost impossible to see. I could make out Miss Kismet. Sat in a chair beside the bed. There was a knife on the table beside her. I have never felt more scared more utterly frightened for my life than I did in that moment. Sit on the bed and start filming, she said. My legs shaking. I somehow managed to make myself walk over to it and do as she asked. Sitting down and swinging the camera up to film her. I began to ask what she wanted me to do. What she wanted me to film. She just told me to keep the camera rolling and not stop until she instructed me to. Nothing else. She whistled loudly, and from the bathroom, a dog came limping out. It looked like it hadn't been fed in days. Thin and unhealthy looking. As I watched, Ms. Kismet picked up the knife from the table and began to slice lines into her hand. My jaw dropped. As I watched, as I filmed... She cut deeply into her own flesh, blood beginning to pour from the wound. She lowered her hand to within reach of the starving animal and allowed the dog to lap at the blood now trickling from the fresh cut. After a while, she would withdraw her hand and repeat the process, cutting into her hand and then her arm, slicing deep wounds into her skin and letting the dog drink her blood. I felt ill. Worse was the look on her face as she did it. That rictus grin that never changed, never left her. She kept that horrible forced smile on her face no matter how much or how deeply she cut herself. Looking like something out of a nightmare. Sat in the dark, smiling that awful smile. Finally, she put the knife down and reached into the drawer of the table it had lain upon. She withdrew a pair of scissors, and as I watched, placed the little finger of her right hand in between them. Slowly, she closed the blades around that digit. Do you know what it sounds like? The crunch of bone as a finger is severed by a pair of scissors? I do now. I could feel the vomit rising in my throat as she slowly cut off that finger. The grin still fixed to her face as she cut through flesh and bone. It fell to the floor, the dog pouncing on it. And finally, she told me I could stop filming. I was shaking, feeling ill, feeling worse than I had expected to feel. I didn't know what this was or why she had asked me to do this and I didn't want to know. And then suddenly, her arm shot out, grabbing me by the leg, her face inches from mine. The grin was gone now, replaced by a look of pure terror, 
of the worst kind of fear I have ever seen on another person's face. Her eyes darted side to side, her body shook. I could feel the blood from her fresh injuries soaking into my clothes. Help me. The words were desperate, spoken as if it actually caused her pain to say them, coming out as a broken and pathetic whimper. For the love of God, please. She's going to kill us all. Don't you understand? She's going to kill us all. She's... And then she stopped, her words cutting off. A little squeak of pain came from her as if someone had grabbed her by the throat. And I realized we weren't alone in that room. Stood in the dark, in one corner of the room was another woman. She was dressed in a tuxedo with a featureless white latex mask over her face. There were no eye holes in the mask, and yet, somehow, as she stood there motionless in the dark, I felt that she was looking at us. That she could see us. Could see me. That she was studying me intently. Watching me very closely, indeed. That motionless woman in the white mask stood silently in the blackness. Made my heart pound made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I had to get out of this room. I stood up, turned, and ran. I ran out of the room, down the stairs, out into the parking lot. I didn't even bother to get into my car. I just ran out, into the street, and away from that motel. Away from Miss Kismet, away from the woman in the white mask. It was the next day that Ms. Kismet showed up at my brother's home. She was all smiles once again and thanked me for my time. My brother had asked no questions about what had happened, most likely because he couldn't care less. And he was happy to hear that Ms. Kismet would now arrange a meeting for him with their director at the set of their current production that they were working on right now. Kismet made it quite clear that this invitation was for my brother only, which suited him just fine. He told me to stay at the house and work on editing the footage we'd put together so far. And he said he'd be back as soon as possible with the interviews with the director and actors involved in Better Film's newest movie. He was beaming, clearly happy that he'd gotten his way. That now he would get to finish his movie with actual footage of what Better Films did. As much as I hated him, in a way, I wanted to tell him not to go. In a way... I was actually scared for him, worried about what might happen. He was a bastard, but he was my brother. But I kept my mouth shut and let him go off with Ms. Kismet, waiting for his return. And I waited. And waited. After it had been several hours, I started to worry. When he hadn't returned at the day's end, I called the police. They told me that I had to wait a few days to file a missing persons report and told me not to worry. That most of the time, people showed up long before that time has passed. My brother didn't. And so, I went to the cops, and I told them about him, and about what he'd been working on, and about Ms. Kismet. I described her to them and told them about better films, which they reacted to skeptically. I can't say I blame them. I told them about the woman in the white mask, and they looked at me like I was crazy, or making it up. Again, I really can't hold that against them. The whole thing was so bizarre and unsettling that I don't know that I would have believed it if someone told me about it. They told me they would look into it, and said they would be in touch with any developments in the case. Anything they managed to turn up. They told me not to worry about my brother, that they were certain he would turn up. The longer I waited without news, the less I worried, though. The less I cared about him at all. Finally free of his bullying, his endless taunts and insults, I found myself becoming more confident, more assured. I began to go out. I began to talk to people. 
to actually start to make friends. I even met a girl at a little bar not too far from my brother's house, who I began to see as more than friends. I started sorting out job interviews. I started feeling good about myself, looking in the mirror and not feeling like crap for once. I felt... happy. Actually happy for the first time in a very long time indeed. I felt like I had worth and value, and that I could make it on my own. A package came a few months ago. It had no stamp, no address, and nothing written on it. Just a brown package, left on the doorstep of my brother's place. I opened it up to find a video cassette inside, with a label on it that simply read, We make documentaries too. I was worried now. Nervous and yet curious at the same time. Not wanting to know what was on the tape and needing to know at the same time. I walked over to the television and slid the tape into the old VCR my brother still owned that I had never bothered to throw out since he had gone missing. It began to play. It was footage of us Footage of us going around to talk to people about better films. Footage of us going into the video store, where we'd met the man who claimed to have seen some of better films' movies. Footage of us going to the homes of the people we'd interviewed about this. Footage of us walking down the street, going to and from places. On several occasions, it zoomed in on my brother. Whoever was behind the camera seeming to be focused on him. I stared at it, a chill running through me. How long had they been filming us for? How long had they been following us, watching our every move? How long had they known about us before Ms. Kismet had met with my brother? The tape went to static for a few moments, and I thought it was over. I was wrong. Red light spilled out of the screen as the picture returned, bringing with it an agonized chorus of screams and howls of agony. On the screen was my brother. He was suspended by what looked like metal hooks, rusty metal hooks, his body hanging from them in a veritable maze of razor wire. The wire round around his body, cutting into his flesh, seeming to move like metal snakes. Whoever was manipulating the wire was off screen, but the effects were very clear. He was missing a hand, a leg, and his ears, his mouth open wide. Screams were all around. The source of them was not visible, but I could hear what sounded like dozens of voices all screaming with him, all howling and shrieking in pain. His eyes were wide and terrified, his body jerking and twitching as he screamed the same words over and over again. The same two words. Help. Me. I stood there, staring at the scene for a moment. My brother, trapped somewhere, in what appeared to be a private hell on earth. Having God knows what else done to him by these people for reasons I would probably never know. I walked over to the set. I turned off the tape. I unplugged the VCR and the TV. And knowing that I would never mention this tape to anyone I knew, I whispered a few words to myself. No, I won't, brother. I burned the tape. To this day, my brother has never been found. I hope you enjoyed Better Films, as written by Alice Thompson and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 18, Daniel Hewitt. Up next, we've got another tale for you. This both written and voiced by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 50, Jay Corvus. In it, we dive into yet another family feud 
this time between a wealthy gentleman and his ex-wife, who are, or should I say, were, fighting over custody of their only son. When a hideous crime impacts them all, our protagonist spares no expenses to get his way. Without further ado, I present to you Best Investment. Being the divorced father of a kid can be a challenging and rewarding job all on its own, especially when you're running your own major business. Now, I'll be honest, I never wanted to have kids in the first place, and the whole marriage thing was originally just a better appeal to future and current business associates. But as you probably pieced together by now, that didn't quite work out. My former wife must have believed that by getting off the pill and getting knocked up, she could save our sour marriage. But honestly, all she did was prolong the inevitable. Long story short, she got half of my assets and money. Well, I got to keep our son. <laughs> He's a chip off the old block. According to his nanny, he has the biggest collection of trading cards than any of the other kids in his friends group. He's incredibly competitive when it comes to games and competitions, and he's well-liked by the majority of the staff. His private tutors tell me that he's quite intelligent, and is at least a year ahead of any student they've ever met. His music teachers seem to believe they found a natural musical prodigy, with the talent to learn just about any instrument he can get his hands on. Ah, <sighs> yes sir, my little Sammy boy is quite the kid indeed. But a man such as myself doesn't always have the time to play catch with his son. I can't make it to parent-teacher meetings when I have important overseas meetings to get to. I can't watch him play with other kids when he goes to the local public park when I'm having lunch with potential new investors. And I can't attend his musical recitals when I need to entertain guests in order to continue mutually beneficial partnerships. On top of all this, the boy's mother has been a constant thorn in my side as well. If she knew how very little time I actually spent with the boy, she would probably have a much better case to try and take him away from me. However, courts don't always look at that sort of thing. All they see is a rich and dedicated father that has afforded his son every opportunity to flourish into the best person he can possibly be. I've given my son the absolute best life and opportunities money can buy. And it helps to have a few judges in your pocket to make that point abundantly clear. But I have to admit that this sort of thing does wear on me after several years of fighting with my ex-wife. It really is true what they say about the love of a mother and her child. That woman will not give me any peace. And it really does get tiresome to keep up appearances as the caring father of a gifted child. Not to mention expensive. Her lawyers are constantly looking for new avenues of approach to try and gain any sliver of custody of Samuel. He just turned 12 last month and he's also begun to ask more and more about his mother as well. If there's one thing I've learned in business, it's that the nagging and consistent little problems can be the ones to bring you down. Anyone with eyes can see that my son is the real chink in my armor, and that point was very well illustrated the day Samuel was kidnapped from the local park he enjoys frequenting. Naturally, the bodyguards did all they could to keep him out of harm's way. They are the best money can buy, after all. But there's only so much they can do without causing harm to the surrounding innocent children in the area. Authorities were called immediately, and federal agents soon got involved. Eventually, I received the ransom note and a package in the mail with instructions to hand over $10 million in cash. In the package, we found my son's ear and a thumb drive with the digital video of the masked assailants cutting it from his head. Naturally, as a concerned and eager father, I complied with their demands 
and immediately got the money together. My ex-wife was informed of the emergency, but strictly asked not to interfere. The money was going to be delivered to a waiting vehicle in the warehouse district of the city. Really, a haven for the worst of the worst. Threats to torture or even kill my son were issued if police showed up. Fortunately, the FBI was using a bag with a built-in tracking device that would help find the kidnappers after we recovered my son. The day of the trade-off, everything went like clockwork. I arrived to deliver the money. A black SUV was parked between two warehouses. A masked man pointed a gun at me and had me drop the money bag 50 feet from him before I was instructed to back off. He took the bag and left a note. As he instructed, I counted to 100 before retrieving the note with instructions on where to find my son. Immediately, FBI agents were already tracking the money. The note led police and investigators to a shallow grave. As it turns out, my son was likely executed soon after they removed his ear. Later that night, the money was tracked down and located at the local post office. Someone had boxed it up and intended to mail it to a very specific address out of state. A property under my ex-wife's name. Her fingerprints and DNA were found all over the package. That woman had done everything she could to cause me grief during the past decade of my life. Not surprising, the authorities found a planner with my son's schedule in it. She knew the exact times he would be in the local park. Police further found journals where she expressed very specific and gruesome things she wished to do to me. Very Lorena Bobbitt stuff. There was no shortage of disdain and hate when it came to the subject of her ex-husband. She pleaded ignorance and innocence to all the charges being brought against her, but with all the evidence and motive found at her home and on the package, the odds were stacked against her. Hell hath no fury and all that jazz after all. Her guilt was only further confirmed when she was found hanging by her bunk in her cozy little prison cell. She had ripped strips of her own mattress fabric to fasten a noose, really quite clever if you think about it. I have to admit, it did cost me a small fortune to orchestrate the whole thing. When the divorce went through, despite me having the better team of lawyers, she somehow still managed to take half of what I own. My response was to take full custody of our, at the time, two-year-old brat. The one thing I knew she truly seemed to care about, <laughs> and ensure that she never got to see him again. The drawback to this is the fact that the little shit never served any other purpose. The nanny I hired to watch over him is truly an unneeded expense. The private tutors are a small fortune all on their own. The music instructors charge more than some investments I make. The private bodyguards have made enough to retire early because of me. And the constant letters and phone calls from an angry ex-wife that refuses to adhere to the rules of a restraining order have caused me more stress than a failed major investment. <sighs> but this $10 million investment, though costly, is very much worth it. It wasn't difficult to pin all of this on Evelyn. I already knew she would have proof that she hated me, that much is obvious. The security detail that watched over Sam reported seeing her at the park, watching Sam from a distance. All I had to do was spend one million dollars on a few low-level thugs with BB guns to take the kid on the day she usually doesn't show. The rest of the money went into the bodyguard's retirement fund. If there's a second thing business has taught me, it's that silence is not golden. It's money green. You see, not only did I remove that annoying bitch and useless rug rat from my life, but I also improved my image. There's no better means of attracting business and improving your public image than assuming the part of a grieving single parent. 
Oh, and in case you're wondering, yes, my wife did indeed hang herself. I didn't pay for an assassin. It wasn't hard to get her to do that when I paid one of the prison guards to show her the full video of Sam's execution. You see, the feds only saw the shortened and heavily edited version that I wanted them to see. The guard told me Evelyn broke just as I knew she would the moment the camera panned out and revealed me as the person slicing off Sam's ear. Then, smiling as I used the same knife to slit his throat. As of right now, this truly has been the best investment. I hope you enjoyed Best Investment, as written and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 50, Jay Corvus. Up next, we've got a third terrifying tome for you, written by Kelly Foster, and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 6, Jack Delmar. In it, we're transported to our favorite time of the year, Halloween! And we're just in time to enjoy what ought to be one of the best parts of the season, decorating. However, as our unlucky protagonist is about to discover, All Hallows' Eve isn't all fun and games for everyone. For some, it just might be a matter of life and death. Literally. <laughs> Without further ado, I present to you the Murphy Horror House. Living in the town of Findlay, you hear a lot of urban legends, scary stories and rumors, usually conjured up to convince the young kids to behave and not stay out past their bedtimes. As I understand it, it wasn't always this way. We moved to town two months ago in mid-August, and immediately it became apparent that Findlay took this time of year really seriously. Apparently, it's coming up on two years, almost to the day, since a small string of seemingly random murders occurred here, all over the course of a week. All the flags in town are lowered to half-mast, and candles and flowers have been piled up in front of a memorial to the victims in the town square. My mother and I haven't paid this much mind. It's sad, sure, but we've just been busy trying to acclimate to our new surroundings. Last Saturday afternoon, we spent a few hours perusing the garage sales in our neighborhood, looking for antiques and interesting Halloween decorations. We came upon a yard that was rather sparse in their offerings. They had some cardboard boxes of books, a rack of old clothes, and an interesting looking scarecrow sitting in a chair by the house. It had a sign tacked to its threadbare overalls. Five dollars. Intrigued, I made my way over to it, and was examining it with interest when a teenager approached me, also looking at the scarecrow. She seemed really nervous and wouldn't take her eyes off the thing. Hi, do you live here? I asked, gesturing to the house. This is a really cool scarecrow, super vintage. She shook her head furiously. No, I, I live down the street. I just wanted to, you're new here, right? New to town? I nodded, a puzzled smile on my face. <laughs> yeah, why? Just, you shouldn't buy that scarecrow, okay? You should leave it be. Haven't you heard the story? She said in a hushed voice. I glanced back at my mother who was browsing through the boxes of books, sending her, help me, in my eyes in case this girl was a little unhinged. Uh, no. What story? She leaned in and proceeded to tell me the story that I've transcribed below to the best of my ability. The Murphy family prided themselves on a few important aspects of their modest middle-class Midwestern life. They rooted for their hometown football team even when they were playing awfully, which was most of the time. They insisted on eating dinner together as a family at least five nights per week with no cell phones allowed at the table. And every year, they constructed the best Halloween yard display in the entire town. It was something Jack's grandparents had begun with him and his siblings when they were still small 
and he grew up knowing that he would show his own kids the joy of spending a month setting up fake coffins filled with rubber mummies and half-decomposed zombies. After the family dinner, but before it started to get dark, they would haul in the props and decorations from their storage shed and begin the painstaking process of arranging them in an expansive front yard. Gallons of fake blood would be spilled and countless bags of fluffy spider webs would be stretched across every tree and bush. Over decades of improvements, the display had grown from a small cluster of foam headstones with a few green hands protruding from the ground into a massive, fenced-off haunted experience, complete with fog machines and sound effects. The surrounding neighborhoods came to expect this wonderland of horror and looked forward to it. Watching the Murphys begin to build it on October 1st and excitedly standing in line to tour it on Halloween night. Lana, the youngest Murphy child, had even made them a modest Facebook page to attract more attention. The spooky tour itself took roughly five to ten minutes, depending on how quickly the group moved across the yard. The display was arranged with only one entrance and one exit. It was barricaded on all other sides, so the only way to escape was to finish walking through it, much like any traditional haunted house. The three kids took turns dressing up as voodoo dolls, murder victims, or demonic clowns to jump out from behind the various props to terrify the visitors. At the end of the tour, everyone would receive their fair share of candy and orange pumpkin-shaped stickers that read, I survived the Murphy Horror House, followed by the respective year. A great time was had by all, and Jack felt pride in knowing he was making his late grandparents proud. The display would vary slightly from year to year, depending on the latest and scariest props that Daisy, Jack's wife, had either scavenged from the after Halloween sales last season or created from scratch. A group of witches huddled over a cauldron might end the tour rather than the traditional chainsaw-wielding madman. A gravedigger might be on the left side rather than the right to accommodate creepier additions. As props were added, some were inevitably retired. Countless years of sitting out in the elements had begun to wear them down. But one part of the display would never change. Not if Jack had anything to say about it. In the very center of the tour, illuminated by green and orange spotlights and hung askew on a rugged cross-like post, was the Scarecrow. Jack made that Scarecrow himself when he was 11 years old. Together with his father, he gathered the hay and bits of old fabric necessary to bring it to life, and it had appeared in their display ever since. The burlap sack that comprised the Scarecrow's face was tattered and full of moth holes, but it still bore its signature crooked smile stitched in black yarn and curling up a bit too far on either side. It wore an old straw hat, a denim work shirt that once belonged to his father, patched overalls, and a pair of dusty boots. Its hair was an unruly black wig that Jack's mother had found at a garage sale, sticking out from under its hat in all directions. And its eyes were painted on, dark red triangles sunken into its face. The Scarecrow was always the first to go up when the display construction began, and the last to come down, in an almost ceremonial fashion. It was the centerpiece of the whole production, even if most of the trick-or-treaters didn't find it scary anymore, not compared to the more modern, detailed props. Jack didn't care. The Scarecrow ruled over the yard like a king, reminding everyone of where the tradition began. That year, it was a week before Halloween, and the display was almost complete. Lana, Ryan, and Trevor had long since given up on decorating and were inside, busy arguing over who would get to dress up as Jason from Friday the 13th. Jack was doing what he always did as the big night drew closer, walking the whole display over and over, checking to see that everything worked and nothing should be tweaked. The sun had sunk below the horizon, and Daisy was calling him to come in, but Jack insisted on one last stroll with his flashlight in hand, Rolling her eyes at her obsessive husband, Daisy relented, and retreated inside to stop her children from killing each other over a costume. Jack entered through the stone gate at the entrance to the tour and followed the path as it wound back and forth through the yard. Occasionally, he would stop to scoot a rubber rat out of the walkway with a shoe or arrange a bloody vampire so its eyes caught the light a bit better. In general, all seemed to be in order. The excitement of knowing it was almost showtime put a skip in Jack's step. He came around the corner to where the Scarecrow was set up, and at first, he thought his eyes might be playing tricks on him in the dim light. The spotlights that usually illuminated the Scarecrow were turned off. That in itself was odd, as all the lights were on the same circuit, 
and the other lights were still blazing around him. Even in the shadowy darkness, it quickly became apparent that the wooden cross that held his old friend was empty. Daisy! Jack bellowed, spinning in circles and shining his flashlight every which way as if to catch the thief. Daisy poked her head out of the front door. You rang? She replied with more exasperation than concern. The scarecrow! It, it's gone! Someone took it! Jack shouted. He was now sprinting toward the end of the maze, checking behind every grave and looking in the front and back of an old hearse. He was sure someone was still lurking inside the display, snickering at his distress. I'm sure nobody took it, dear. You probably just left it somewhere, Daisy sighed. Jack ran up to her, panting from exertion. You know it's the first thing I put up. I saw it less than 20 minutes ago. It was there the last time I walked the maze, he protested, still shining the flashlight around behind the porch and into the dark stillness of the yard. Nothing else seemed to miss. It's just some neighborhood kids playing tricks on us. I'm sure they'll bring it back. We'll arm the alarm system tonight before bed, Daisy replied, taking her husband by the elbow and gingerly guiding him inside. She didn't completely understand his fixation with the scarecrow, but she hadn't seen him this upset in quite some time. Okay, he said with a huff, clearly not placated. And that was what they did. The alarm system covered the entire yard, from the end of the driveway and back to the house. It was a simple motion-activated number. Anything larger than a squirrel would set it off with blaring sirens and flashing lights. Because of this, they only ever armed it during the month of October and only for the two weeks leading up to Halloween when most of the expensive props were put out. They had been awoken abruptly more than once in the past years because someone's dog got loose and triggered it accidentally. That night, however, the alarm did not go off, and in the morning, Jack awoke bright and early from a restless sleep. He ran to their bedroom window and peered down. Their room was on the second floor and overlooked the front yard. Stunned, he could plainly see, even from a distance, that the scarecrow was back on its post. Its head was even drooping slightly to the right, just as he had left it the night before. How is this possible? Jack asked anxiously, as they made breakfast later that morning and prepared to usher the kids off to school. Daisy shrugged, more focused on packing lunches than their conversation. Maybe you were mistaken. You said yourself the spotlights were off. No. I know what I saw. How did they get that scarecrow back on its post in the middle of the night without triggering the alarms? He demanded. It was baffling to him. The scarecrow was as big as a full-grown man and unwieldy to carry. He always needed his eldest son Ryan's help hanging it from the post, and he considered himself fairly fit. It must have taken at least two people to remove it and put it back. Maybe three if they were young teens. Yet none of them had heard a thing. Daisy stuffed a bagel in his mouth and handed him his coffee. Maybe the alarm system's faulty. We haven't used it in a year. I can have someone out to look at it tomorrow. Don't worry so much, Jack. You got what you wanted. It's back, isn't it? She reminded him. He was about to argue further when the sound of the morning news distracted them both. Lana turned up the volume on the TV in the living room and the rest of the family slowly congregated around it. Tragedy struck in Findlay last night when 12-year-old Marla Greenberg was found murdered in her bed. We're still receiving details, but it appears she was... At this point, there was a pause as the newscaster swallowed thickly, his expression deeply uncomfortable. Disemboweled. Several of her internal organs are missing. There was no sign of forced entry and the police are investigating the entire Greenberg family. Finley PD has declined to offer any interviews, and the family has asked for privacy during this difficult time. In shock and horror, Jack reached for the remote, taking it from Lana and changing the channel before the news story could continue. Oh my god, Daisy cried, her hands flying up to her lips and her eyes welling with tears. I know Marla. She's in Trevor's class. Oh, her poor parents. For all you know, her poor parents are the ones who killed her, Ryan said with no small amount of snark. Trevor nodded his agreement, forever mimicking his older brother, and Lana just rolled her eyes. Daisy shushed them, still fighting back tears. Jack was also thoroughly shaken by this, although he tried not to show it. 
Nothing like this ever happened in their city. There were mostly happy, pleasant people here. The strange events from the previous night, combined with this latest development, added to the heavy sense of unease that was building in his gut. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was very, very wrong. They hurried the kids off to school with multiple reminders to be careful and hurry home. As soon as the bus drove off down the street, Jack called the alarm company and scheduled maintenance for the following afternoon. Whatever was going on, nobody was setting foot in their yard again without them knowing it. That night, it took Jack hours to fall asleep. The kids had all come home from school raving about Marla Greenberg's murder and spouting several theories their friends had told them. Try as he might to change the subject at dinner, it was all any of them wanted to talk about. Jack supposed he understood. Marla had been their age. <laughs> they must be frightened that something might happen to them too. The creepy time of year did nothing to help the situation. It all fed right into their mounting Halloween hysteria. After spending hours tossing and turning in bed, mulling it all over in his mind, he decided to give up and go get a glass of water from the kitchen. As he rose from the bed and passed by the bedroom window, something outside caught his eye. He hurried over and looked down into the yard, rubbing his eyes to make sure he was actually seeing what he thought he was seeing. The scarecrow was gone again! His hands gripped the windowsill tightly, his knuckles turning white. It was everything he could do not to wake Daisy. He knew she would write it off as another neighborhood prank, cite the broken alarm system as the culprit, and assure him it would be fixed the next day. The straps that held the scarecrow to its post were loose and waving gently in the nighttime breeze, and he could barely make out little bits of hay leading off in the direction of the exit. Part of him wanted to sit on the front porch with a baseball bat and wait for the intruders to return, in case they decided to steal other props from them. But something about the whole situation gave him pause. Why would they bring the scarecrow back only to steal it again? Were they just messing with him? What were they doing with it? It didn't feel right. Reluctantly, he retrieved his glass of water and tried to go back to sleep. But this time he cracked the window open a few inches to better hear what was going on in the yard. He slept facing it. Jack woke hours later to the sun streaming in and Daisy shaking him roughly by the shoulder. Bewildered, he blinked his sleepy eyes open and stared up at her face. She looked extremely pale, and she had clearly been crying. Jack? It's happened again, she said quietly, her throat tight. Come downstairs. Not fully awake and barely understanding what she meant, he got up and reached for his bathrobe. In his haste, he forgot to glance out the window. The TV was blaring when they entered the living room. The kids were poised in a semicircle around it, frozen in place like statues as they watched the news story unfold. In a shocking turn of events, a second murder has taken place in Findlay roughly 24 hours after the first. The scene at 13-year-old Danielle LeBeau's bedside was equally grisly according to Findlay PD. This time the boy's heart and lungs were missing. Jack's own heart sunk into his stomach at these words. The image on screen showed crime scene tape crisscrossing the LeBeau's front door as paramedics loaded a covered body into the back of an ambulance. Possibly, most horrifying of all, they lived only two streets over from the Murphys. The Greenbergs at least lived on the other side of town. This was getting too close for comfort. Again, no sign of forced entry was found and the police are now convinced that this is the work of an organized, highly stealthy, and sadistic killer. Finley has decided to enforce a mandatory curfew of 9pm for all children under 18 until the perpetrator has been brought into custody. Daisy switched the TV off. This time, none of the kids cracked jokes, or even moved a muscle. Lana was quietly crying, and trying to hide it. Dad? Is someone gonna kill us too? Trevor asked with wide eyes, craning his head up to look at his father. Jack put a firm hand on the boy's head. No, Trev. I would never let anything happen to you guys. Jack, maybe we should keep them home from school today, Daisy said weakly. She looked like she might pass out. Jack shook his head. No, we don't put our lives on hold because some psycho is trying to scare everyone. That's just letting him win. The police are doing their jobs. We need to do ours. Guys, do you want to stay home? Three heads shook slowly from side to side. Most likely, they would feel safer in a school surrounded by plenty of adults and security supervision. 
not to mention all of their friends. Okay, then let's get ready. No sooner had the words left his mouth than he thought he caught movement in his peripheral vision. Something was outside. He approached the picture window that faced the front yard and pushed the curtains further apart, expecting to see a bird or someone walking their dog. Everything was perfectly still in the Halloween display. Everything was as it should be. The scarecrow, he was no longer surprised to see, was once again back on its post, smiling merrily in the morning mist. Later that day, as the alarm system repairman wandered around their property checking on all the motion sensors and wiring, Jack took another stroll through the display and came to a stop in front of the scarecrow. He stared up at it, hands on his hips, brow furrowed deeply in thought. He had taken a day off work to be there when the maintenance guys came and was spending time trying to logically work through what could be happening on his property. He hadn't yet told Daisy about the Scarecrow's latest disappearing act. He wanted to solve the puzzle on his own, and he knew her answer would be, It was just a dream. If the alarm system had been broken for the last two days, he supposed it was possible that a few older kids had snuck into the yard and moved the Scarecrow. They must have moved quickly, especially last night. It disappeared and reappeared again within the span of, at most, three hours, by his estimation. Odd that even with the window open, he didn't hear them working. The straps that held its arms and waist to the post were literally nailed into the wood, so they would have needed to pull out the nails and then replace them afterward. How could they have not heard the sound of someone hammering? He walked a bit closer to the scarecrow, examining it. Something was off about it. He could see it now that he was up close. It seemed fuller than it usually was. Over many years, straw and stuffing had fallen out of its torso and limbs, and the kids had diligently packed it back in every other season or so. But even with occasional fixes, it was always rather slim. Now its chest and stomach seemed robust, as if it had been generously restuffed. He almost chuckled to himself. What was he really suggesting here? That some kids were stealing a scarecrow just to, what, refill it? Make it look nicer? It was a ridiculous notion. Daisy, or someone, had obviously come out and stuffed it a bit more last night before they went to bed. Sighing, Jack gave the old scarecrow a pat on the leg, and went to meet the alarm company guys at the other end of the yard. They were finishing up their assessment. Aha, Mr. Murphy, the lead worker said. He was scratching his head as he handed Jack a clipboard with some data and forms to sign. Strangest thing. Far as we can tell, your alarm system's in perfect working order. Jack froze, pen in hand. What do you mean? I mean, it works just fine and always has. We can test it and show- Yes, please do. I need to know that it works. Jack interrupted, becoming somewhat hysterical now. So they did. They took turns walking through various parts of the yard with the system armed, and sure enough, it was quickly set off each time. They disarmed it immediately after every test, so as not to cause an uproar with the neighbors. Jack insisted they try walking through the display itself and up to the scarecrow, just to be sure. They didn't even make it halfway there before the sirens blared and the lights flashed. It doesn't make sense, Jack said under his breath, after a solid half hour of testing the alarm. Could the intruders possibly be disarming it and then arming it again when they leave? He asked the workers. He was now desperate to find an answer. Any kind of answer. Their leader shook his head. They'd need the passcode and access to the remote. There's no evidence that the system has been tampered with. He paused. Mr. Murphy, nothing is officially missing from your property, correct? He was looking at Jack with that suspicious side eye that clearly indicated he was concerned about the man's mental health. Well, no. I mean, not right now, but then I wouldn't worry. If you have any other concerns, don't hesitate to call us again. That evening, as Jack was helping Daisy prepare dinner, and trying to figure out a way to discuss everything he had learned that day with her, he overheard the children gossiping amongst themselves in the living room. I heard that they didn't just take Danny's heart and lungs. They took some of his skin, too, Trevor was saying to Ryan and Lana. Shut up. That's gross and it's not true, Lana retorted matter-of-factly. Well, my friend Christian lives a few houses down from them, and her sister Tasha said that the police found pieces of what looked like hay in and around the bodies, Ryan chimed in. So 
they were killed by horses? Trevor asked with a frown. Or cows, Ryan replied. This made Lana giggle. Guys, enough, Daisy snapped. She left the kitchen to gather them for dinner. Jack hadn't moved an inch the entire time he'd been listening to his kid's conversation. He had seen bits of hay recently himself, hadn't he? Hay and straw, small piles of it leading off out of their yard when the scarecrow was taken. Could their disappearing prop and the two grisly murders be connected somehow? Was the person committing these heinous crimes also sneaking into their yard each night? It had to be coincidence. Still, his blood ran cold at the thought. That night, after the security system was armed and Daisy and the kids were fast asleep, Jack sat up on the front porch with a flashlight in one hand and his metal baseball bat in the other, bundled up against the chilly October air. He made sure to sit back in the shadows where he wouldn't be noticed and kept his flashlight switched off. This time, he was going to see who or what was moving the scarecrow, and he was going to call the police. He just had to catch them in the act to prove he wasn't going crazy. Hours passed in stillness and silence. It was getting even colder, and Jack grabbed the blanket he had brought outside with him, wrapping it around his shoulders. Nothing in the yard was stirring. The props were all as they had left them, casting haunting silhouettes on the grass in the moonlight. From where he sat, he could make out most of the scarecrow's hat poking up in the center of the display, and a few tufts of its frizzy black wig. He kept his eyes trained on it, the minutes ticking away. Jack! The blood-curdling scream split the night and snapped Jack out of his slumber. He had dozed off in the chair. At first, he thought he had dreamt his wife's cry for help, but then it came again. From inside the house, Jack fumbled to turn on his flashlight and pointed it at the scarecrow with shaking hands. It was gone. He leapt up and off the porch, triggering the alarm with an ear-splitting peal that drowned out Daisy's screams. He sprinted closer to the display, shining his light up and over into the center of it. But now he was certain. The scarecrow was definitely missing, and piles of straw led away from its post, away to the left, past where he stood, past him, across the porch, and through their open front door. The screams mixed with the deafening siren of the alarm caused total chaos as Jack flew through the door and up the stairs, his feet barely touching the floor. Following Daisy's voice, he pounded down the hallway and toward their bedrooms. He tried to hold his hands to his ears and block out the alarm, but they still had a death grip on the baseball bat and flashlight. He wasn't sure, but he thought her cries were coming from Trevor's room. He arrived at the open door just after Daisy's strangled yells were silenced and were quickly replaced by his own. There, crouched over Trevor's pale and mangled body, was the scarecrow. Daisy was slumped over on the floor behind it, a kitchen knife still in her limp hand, as if she had tried and failed to defend her son. The scarecrow ever so slowly paused and turned to look at Jack was still standing in the doorway, with his mouth agape and his whole body shaking. Its head was illuminated by the beam of Jack's flashlight. The straw hat and black hair were all too familiar, but now, instead of burlap and string, it was wearing Trevor's distorted and bloodied face. His skin, it smiled far too wide, and with Trevor's mouth it said, Trick-or-treat! By the time the girl was done telling me this tale in magnificent detail, the sun was starting to dip toward the horizon, and the garage sale was closing up shop for the night. I grinned at her and thanked her for the entertainment. I guess it's true what they say about small towns being full of colorful characters. I promptly bought the scarecrow from the lady who was selling it. Who could resist with a crazy story like that? Totally perfect for the season. It's in the garage at the moment, but I'm going to set it up next to our porch tomorrow night, alongside our freshly picked pumpkins. I really feel like it'll pull the whole Halloween vibe together. Uh, 
I hope you enjoy The Murphy Horror House, as written by Kelly Foster and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number six, Jack Del Mar. Don't forget, all of tonight's performances were featured in the second round of this year's 2019 Evil Idol Horror Voice Acting Competition, hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel now and running the next several months. If you enjoyed the performances tonight, visit our YouTube channel and vote on theirs and the other entries in the competition. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see our current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. We'd also like to remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word, and to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. As always, I'm so glad you were able to join us tonight. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Logo by Craig Groshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.